Okay. Yeah. Hel hello, everybody. Um, please, please mute, your mute yourself. Um, so welcome. Um, my name is um, Nicholas. I am a postdoc uh, at ETH Zurich and a co-organizer of this year's uh, NES conference. Um, and I have the great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, James Meadowcroft for the first keynote of this conference. Uh, James holds the Canada Research Chair in Governance for Sustainable Development at Carleton University in Ottawa. And he's a professor at both the School of Public Policy and Administration and the Department of Political Science. And since many years, um, James is one of the leading thinkers in the transitions community, and his work is uh, published widely in uh, leading transitions uh, journals, such as Research Policy, Policy Sciences, or Environmental Innovation and Societal Transitions. Um, and his research is focused on uh, how governments can cope and are coping with the emerging of, um, emergence of sustainability challenges. And uh, most notably, he has contributed to the research agenda around the politics of transitions, um, as well as transition pathways. Um, beyond research, James is also an active figure in the transitions community. Uh, so many will know him as uh, the host of uh, the last uh, physical IST conference, um, which took place 2019 in Ottawa. Um, and so given his research on trans transition pathways, um, which is perfectly in line with the theme of this year's uh, NEST conference, um, but also his active role in the community, um, we can think of no one better than James for the first keynote. So we are very excited to have you here, um, James. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, so before James will take over uh, from me, just uh, some points on housekeeping. Um, so James will talk for roughly uh, 40 minutes. And afterwards, we'll have uh, a moderated Q&A session for uh, roughly another 40 minutes. Um, so to ask questions, uh, please post them in the chat. Also, you can also do this during the talk. And then I will read them out. Um, so please send the questions to everyone. Um, so use the respect respective function in the chat. Um, or you can also send them directly to me. Do not use the nearby function, because otherwise I cannot see the questions uh, that are asked um, uh, uh, more far away in the room. Um, with that, um, I'll hand it over to you, James. Um, please uh, share your screen, and we're looking forward to your talk. Great. Uh, let's... Whoops, does that work? Yes, that works perfect. Okay, great, hi. Um, well, first it's uh, very nice to be here with you. I mean, it would be even nicer to actually be here with you, but uh, this is um, not, not a bad substitute. Um, I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today. Um, the, the title of my talk is Pathways and the Politics of uh, Transitions. Um, and this is the kind of topics that I'm going to be talking about. Um, it's not going to be a formal exposition, uh, but really um, a series of uh, remarks and comments, and reflections, and sharing with you some of the work that um, I'm doing now. Um, so I'll start with a couple of introductory um, uh, reflections. Um, then I'll move to the question of why does politics matter, particularly uh, for transitions? Um, what can political analysis contribute to transitions and to understanding transitions? Uh, and then for the second half of the talk, I'm going to really be looking at some practical work that we're doing. Uh, some of you may heard of this organization we've set up called the Transition Accelerator. So I'll be talking about that, which is really about kind of practical intervention in transitions. And finally, uh, talk about a net zero report <clears throat> which the accelerator has um, recently released. So 
my introductory fl- reflections really start with the fact that it's been nearly 20 years that I've been engaged in one way or another with um, the sustainability transitions uh, <coughs> research and community. Um, Originally, my work was very much on governance for sustainability, and that is goes back even further than 20 years. Um, and I began as a kind of sympathetic critic. In fact, I was invited by uh, some of the uh, leading transition scholars to kind of um, uh, engage from a, a political science and point of view and have kind of more or less evolved into uh, a member of the community and so on. <clears throat> I guess I'd say... Um, that I think, um, looking back on this period, it's been tremendously exciting. And I think you are entering um, uh, a really dynamic period, both in terms of transition uh, research because of the way it has expanded and matured and begun to interact with uh, more disciplines, um, and also with uh, very practical movements and experiences uh, related to pr- uh, promoting sustainability transitions, but also that some of the changes that we um, thought about 15 or 20 years ago are actually beginning to happen uh, at scale. And I know from you, <laughs> your point of view, it seems that everything is taking torturously long and we're too late and nothing's happening. But believe me, from where things looked in uh, 1985 or 1990, it's in some sense almost ima- unimaginable the scale at which uh, environment and sustainable uh, sustainability issues um, have become integrated into pol- uh, political life. Um, that's one point I want to say in, in, in terms of introduction. The second is really um, a kind of cautionary note about theory. Um, So this is funny because my PhD is originally in political theory, Um, but I like to warn uh, all my PhD students and so on to don't confuse theory with the actual world. So theory is really a tool for understanding uh, and particularly transforming the world. Um, And my maxim has always been to apply it when it's useful and when it doesn't fit, then dump it uh, and look elsewhere. And I I told a couple of you yesterday this anecdote, so po- apologies if I repeat it, but it's a, a, an anecdote about um, Lumen or more precisely about one of my PhD students who was a very bright student working on air pollution. And um, kind of a year into his PhD, maybe a bit more, um, I gave him a long list of 60 books to go away and read and come back and we talk about them. And he went away for a month and a half or maybe a bit more, came back and said, well, I've read all that stuff, but what I found is Lumen. Lumen is absolutely brilliant. His theory explains everything. Uh, I want to dig into it a bit more. So I said, okay, you know, go ahead, <laughs> read some more, come back, we'll talk about it. And this went on for a good while. Um, and he said, I want Lumen to be central to my thesis and so on. So, But for a long time, I've been trying to push him to actually look at, he was looking at air pollution in North America, to actually look at some empirical facts and, and, and uh, histories and so on. So he went away and did that and he came back and he said, oh, I've got a big problem, I have a big problem. Uh, I said, what is it? He said, well, it doesn't fit. Lumen doesn't fit. So I said, oh, that's interesting. What do you conclude? And he said, oh, I'm going to go back and read him more carefully. (laughs) So um, he obviously was not drawing the right (laughs) lesson. Um, Now, the the story ends well. Lumen ended up as exactly a three-line footnote in his thesis, and the thesis was fine. But my point really was um, often people get a bit carried away with the theory in the sense that they ram the facts and the reality into into to to fit. And I would suggest that that's not the most productive way uh, to do it. Uh, and to be honest, I have read many really brilliant empirical th- theses 
and here I am not talking about in transition scholarship, um, but theses which have uh, in, in, in political science, uh, which have done great work on the ground and then rammed the facts or what was found, made it into a story with the most fashionable um, theory of the moment. Um, 20 years later, it's the empirical stuff in the thesis that people are really interested in, and they kind of chuckle at the theoretical uh, framing. So I am not anti-theory at all. It's just a kind of uh, a cautionary note that um, I would say at the beginning. So let's get on to uh, kind of the main issue. Why does politics matter? Well, in some sense, this seems um, completely obvious. Uh, politics plays um, a critical role in shaping uh, socio-technical transitions, and you can see that, you know, in all sorts of ways. Um, just consider um, the change in the United States since Trump has left and uh, Biden has has uh, assumed the presidency. All sorts of things that were paralyzed or derailed are now happening. This is not to say. Biden is, is, is a miracle worker, but just that polit politics really matters uh, when we're dealing with societal change. I guess a second element, which is another way of saying this, is that politics um, lies behind policy. Very often, um, researchers, and this is true of, of many disciplines, it's true in the transition community, we focus a lot on policy. We write policy briefs for government. We suggest that uh, if we just uh, changed uh, this particular policy, things would be better. Um, and it's really, I mean, it's blindingly obvious, but it's really criti critical to emphasize that politics lies behind policy. And very often it's only by addressing politics that it's possible to actually achieve change in the policy sphere. Um, very often when people are talking about uh, politics or political science, they refer these three to these three big ideas of interests, um, ideas, in, uh, interests, and institutions. And these are, of course, three areas in which um, uh, pol politics, uh, uh, three areas through which politics is 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 articulate articulated and re relates of course to to transitions so ideas um range from the very big from uh to the very small but just to give one example of something that is a really a seismic change that is happening right now for more than 30 years um Governance in the um, OECD type countries, and of course it varies from country to country, but has very strongly been dominated by what is often characterized as, as kind of neoliberal ideas about uh, the state keeping its nose out of business, um, putting reliance in markets uh, to sort out societal problems and so on. And just in the past, you know, five years it's begun to change, but in the last uh, year it's been particularly accelerated, of course, by thing, uh, the pandemic and so on. But suddenly you get uh, governments starting to talk in a much more open way about industrial policy, uh, um, about the need for the state to take a more active role vis-a-vis -vis climate change. I, I mentioned the pan pandemic. To some extent, this is true also from fallout from the economic crisis in 2008, though it is unbelievable how particularly European leaders were uh, stuck in a rut. Um, the stimulus after that uh, recession was very weak, uh, which explains to a large extent why unemployment remains so high in Europe uh, compared to uh, the relatively more uh, spending easy um, United States. But that kind of shift in, in ideas uh, is ex extremely important. Well, interests are pretty uh, obvious, and you can see this um, obviously in relation to climate change, particularly with the acting, uh, the, the action of, of um, uh, the oil and gas companies. 
but I'd like to call out the banks as well. A, a recent study showed, and, and this, this is something on Canada, a recent study showed that of the 10 uh, biggest banks loaning money to fossil fuels, I think three Canadian banks are in that total. And we have two more in the next uh, five or six um, uh, if you extend the list beyond beyond the the top ten, so obviously interests uh, uh, play an enormous role in in political action and institutions as well. Um, um, and I'm not going to go on about that particularly, but what I would like to um, make a, a point a little bit more is about the role of the state uh, in uh, in transitions. So very often, sorry, very often you will hear people say, well, <clears throat> most transitions historically have been driven by, by markets or by people wanting to, uh, investors wanting to make money, so they develop a new technology, and then we get electric light or, or whatever. Um, but climate change is really different. Um, because this is a problem where it's the environment that that is a problem. It's um, uh, uh, not a, a, a kind of problem of private motivation and profit. So here it's the state, it's government that has to uh, be the key mover uh, and um, uh, introduce policies that force uh, society to move in a low carbon direction. So there is some truth to that, but really, um, I think it's not sufficiently been perhaps understood or emphasized that historically speaking, all the major uh, socio-technical transitions that we talk about, um, the state and governments have played an absolutely critical and central role. Um, and you can think about um, the building out of the railroads. Yes, there were um, private uh, capitalists who made lots of money out of that, um, but states played uh, a critical role uh, in that. Uh, you can think about the electrification of society, um, um, many agricultural changes, almost in every case. I, I won't say always because someone will come up with something, but the state has played uh, a a critical role in mobilizing, accelerating, applying resources, and so on. Um, and just worth thinking about why that is. So the first thing, so I'm going to point to three reasons I think are really important. The first thing is the question of strategic interest. So states, uh, at least over the past couple of hundred years, have realized that major um, economic, uh, technological transformations um, are absolutely uh, of strategic uh, significance. Um, and, and here are three ways in which this is kind of interrelated ways in which these are manifest. First is, of course, military ascendancy. Um, the Europeans conquered uh, North and South America uh, in part because of their mastery of superior military uh, technologies, particularly uh, sailing ships, uh, firearms, the horse, uh, uh, use of steel, and so on. Um, and since that time and beyond, states have realized that technological changes, socio-technical transitions, can be uh, of um, in a great military importance. So uh, second uh, thing related to that, and you can think of many examples in transitions where this is the case. So the famous example of kind of moving from sailing ships to steamships, who was it who was willing to pay two or three times over the odds for a ship uh, that de developed the niches for this technology? Well, it was the military. Uh, particularly the British and the Americans at the, uh, at the beginning, who wanted steel hull ships that could, uh, because of their advantage, obviously, and <laughs> with a motor instead of sails, you could uh, move when, you know, against the wind or when there was no wind and so on. But many, many technologies have been rolled out. A lot of the things uh, that we know today in um, 
to do with the internet and mobile phones were developed uh, in the kind of American military industrial complex originally, uh, and many, many other technologies fall into this category. Satellite space, travel, radar, uh, nuclear power, and so on and so on. Second thing is, of course, economic development, which is obvious. Um, again, at least since the 19th century, it has been absolutely clear that the countries that achieve um, geopolitical ascendancy are those with the strongest underlying economic development. And you can think of many examples where states are pushing directly accelerating and enabling transitions in order to i mean they don't call them transitions but but um in order to further um uh economic development and finally related to both of these is technological supremacy um and you can see all of these things happening today uh vis-a-vis -vis, um particularly the competition between the united states and china where the us is very afraid of losing technological supremacy which really gave them the 20th century as their century um and um so all of these are kind of a fundamental reason why states get entwined in uh, in transitions. A second thing is to do with law, property rights, and power. Most major transitions require fundamental changes to property rights or to other laws um, and the application of power in order to bring them about. So state the states as the highest uh, kind of uh, legal authority um, actually push that through it in practice. So think about something like I mentioned building out railroads. Well, you can't build railroads if you don't have land and you can't. Um, and so the state actually either expropriates land uh, or uh, in the colonial situation, granted land to railroad companies to, to build them through. Um, another good example is um, the... Um, ICT revolution, which has been taking place over the past 30 years, major changes in property rights have been needed uh, to secure digital copyright. Uh, think of all the arguments about, you know, who make who gets the money in the music industry, um, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and again, new socio-technical arrangements require new legal arrangements, uh, and so only the state can bring those about. And thirdly, the kind of more obvious thing about once um, uh, new sorts of arrangements emerge, then competing interests reach into the state to try to use it to further uh, or uh, slow down change. And of course, the classic thing we see today is um, the, the struggle uh, around uh, fossil fuel extraction uh, and a fossil fuel-based industry. And again, the United States is almost a caricatural example of that, where every time the presidency changes parties, everything gets rolled back that the last group did. Um, and a very close uh, links between the political process and major, really important uh, economic interests tied with the fossil fuel uh, lobbies or with those who are trying to move beyond uh, fossil uh, energy, si energy systems. And so if we think about this uh, in terms of sustainability transitions, well, it's fairly obvious that the state can play and must play a critical role in orienting and accelerating change. And again, the critical things that states have um, are law and compulsion, money, the, cap the capacity to mobilize resources based fine fundamentally on law and compulsion, and uh, legitimacy, which takes different forms in different states, and in most of our countries, uh, it's somehow linked to um, uh, uh, legitimacy, um, uh, uh, somehow linked to uh, democracy and so on. But the just to return then to this point in the middle of the slide about why states are entwined with all these transitions, um, I actually think is quite important and needs to be better reflected in um, our literature. So it doesn't seem so much as if, oh, well, just this climate change thing is different. Um, um, 
it is and it isn't. <laughs> so the next thing I'd like to talk about briefly is what can political analysis contribute? So here I'm thinking of political science, but since I don't, I'm very hesitant applying the word science in this context, I'm not going to call it science. I'm talking, calling it political analysis. What can it contribute? Well, there are huge and very interesting literatures uh, in political science that are really useful for um, thinking about uh, transitions and sustainability. I'm just going to mention five that I personally found useful. And this is not meant to be an exclusive list, but the most obvious is the political literature uh, in normative political theory about justice, equality, rights, democracy, all of things. Uh, these have direct bearing on uh, uh, on transitions, and these are immensely rich uh, literatures. Um, one another one is the literature on planning and implementation, um, and this goes back to a kind of more fundamental philosophical question, if you like. Um, but it's also a practical political uh, question. To what extent is it possible to think about steering societal development? Um, and, you know, there are all sorts of implications on this and issues that come in in terms of uncertainty, unintended consequences, um, the limitations on society's capacity of uh, re reflexivity. Um, and um, there are, you know, interesting debates and, and perspectives which are directly relevant to tr transitions about the difficulties uh, governments have in realizing um, um, uh, reform uh, and pushing forward uh, sustainability transitions. Um, a third one is something you may all be familiar with already, depending if you have taken uh, political science courses, but is the whole question, um, I mean, I just put down Mancure o Olson's famous book, The Logic of Collective Action, which is really about the problem of um, concentrated power and organization and diffuse power and organization. And, and Olson pointed out how, you know, how is it possible that relatively small minority producer groups uh, can organize so effectively to maintain policy that is counterproductive for the vast majority of the population. Um, put it another way, how do, how do big, a few handful of big companies prevent democratic change for things that seem obviously in the advantage of the vast majority? And essentially he looks at the relative difficulty of organizing um, these various constituencies uh, and what that means for political action and their lessons uh, uh, to, to be drawn. Um, a third thing is perhaps obvious, but is the, the, the whole strand of pol political economy, which is really just a basket for many approaches that link together, tie together economics and politics and look at the economic, particularly the economic foundations of political power and political behavior. Um, from Marx, uh, I mentioned here Fordism, which is really all about the reorganization of the, uh, uh, of the factory and industrial production that occurred in the kind of first decade, couple of decades of the, the 20th century. But this goes right forward to today with um, various analyses of um, uh, uh, things like, uh, off, what, as I said, often called neoliberalism and so on, the different models of accumulation uh, that are dominant in society. Um, and finally, um, a call out to um, uh, political discourse analysis, which can be tremendously revealing of uh, the ways in which um, different uh, interests organize and link some of the points um, that, uh, that the, particularly the normative theory, the collective action and political economy, how they actually get manifested in, uh, in political argument. So that's it for what I wanted to say in the, the kind of first part of my talk. In the 
Next, I'm going to switch veins, uh, you know, quite uh, significantly and talk really about a practical example of intervention in um, in 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 the politics of tr uh, transition, um, which I've been involved in over the past um, going on two years now. So the first thing, um, about a year and a half ago, we actually, me with some other academic colleagues and funded by uh, uh, a series of Canadian charitable foundations, set up something called the Transition Accelerator. Some of you may have uh, heard about that. This It's a national not-for-profit that works to define and build out uh, transition pathways. And we really kind of kicked this off because of frustration with the climate policy debates in Canada, which I won't bore you with in detail, but let's just say they are have essentially been focused on pipelines and carbon pricing. Carbon pricing is the government's solution to climate change. And um, I don't want to be too cruel. It's not their only solution, but it's the one that gets talked about most. Uh, and pipelines, well, we have an active oil and gas industry that is frustrated. It can't get its oil out to market and wants more pipelines. And of course, other people have stood in the way of that. And so for or against pipelines, uh, for or against carbon pricing, more or less sums up 15 years of climate policy debates in Canada. Um, so the Accelerator basically is an organization that <clears throat> I think in the literature we describe this as an intermediate organization. It's uh, a catalyst to try to mobilize forces on the ground to um, build out uh, pilots and experiments and shake things up so that in the larger sense, um, it opens more political space for uh, state intervention. Um, and a couple of things that uh, are really important in the accelerator's perspective is the idea of linking climate to other system problems and harness disruptive forces. Well, disruptive forces are really easy to understand. Uh, personal mobility is being dramatically shaken up by a series of things. We have not just electric vehicles, there are autonomous vehicles on the horizon. Um, there are different conceptions that young people have towards owning a car or not owning a car. They're the ride hailing apps and so on. This system is rapidly changing independent of um, or, or uh, of just the climate change problem. So a lot of the question comes down to how can we harness those disruptive changes for the better and not for the worse? Um, and um, I guess the other thing I would, and, and system problems, uh, well, there are lots of system problems, but also think about social movements like the recent concern with equity, which again can be something that can be linked towards transformation uh, or or not. And uh, so we put a lot of emphasis on building out and defining regional and sectoral pathways. Uh, sectors should be obvious for anybody in the transitions community. In Canada, regional is absolutely critical because the country is so big and diverse. Um, Alberta is just, with its oil industry, is just totally uh, different from Quebec. So the current priorities that we're working on, and I'll just touch them briefly, are the Northeast Decarbonization Alliance, which is basically about uh, coordinating um, decarbonization across Eastern Canada and the Northeast United States. Um, there's lots of modeling and suggestions that it can be done much cheaper, much quicker if there is uh, cooperation. Um, to enhance electrification. The problems are all political. Uh, all of Canada's electric, each province has its own electric grid. They some trade, but autarky has been the principal. Uh, <clears throat> the Americans buy lots of electricity from Hydro-Quebec, but everybody hydro hates Hydro-Quebec because it's a monopoly player. So building some sort of a uh, a process, uh, an engagement process, um, is 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 critical. Buildings um, are fairly obvious um, because they're big GHG uh, producers. Vehicle electrification, autonomy, links to road transport. 
uh, and hydrogen is an energy system, an alternative energy car carrier. So those are four things that we're we're working on um, at the moment. So here I kind of just lay out how we present the difference between the conventional approach to dealing with climate change and the pathway approach. So the conventional approach kind of emphasizes incremental GHG reductions to meet specific, specific targets. Um, it's based on an economic rationality. Adjusting prices causes economic agents to shift their behavior. Um, it's focused economy-wide. The policy instrument is carbon pricing and complementary measures. The problem is the absence of political will to adopt a pricing regime that's strong enough to drive the changes. And the outcome is, well, certainly in Canada, slow progress, polarization, and not much else. Um, so all of this is should be completely obvious to people in the transition community, but it's not at all obvious to people um, uh, more largely. And in co contrast to that, we say systems transitions that develop de deliver multiple benefits, not just low GHGs, but also GHGs. The causal theory is, is multi-causal and co-evolutionary. Sectors and regions rather than econ economy-wide measures. Policy mixes and complexity uh, and, and uh, so on. So this is the kind of, we have a kind of transdisciplinary uh, pathway development process that we uh, uh, work on. Um, Again, these steps should be kind of familiar to most people, but we emphasize doing this, researchers doing it with stakeholders to understand the existing system, co-develop shared visions and pathways, analyze the heck out of it uh, using models, uh, widening the stakeholders involved to stress test the things and so on. And if you do the process pretty well over a year, uh, or two or three, uh, launch consortia um, and practical action to actually build out these uh, pathways. So just to show how it works, and I realize this is complicated and you can't follow it, we've been doing for two years um, a pathway development process in the trucking industry in Alberta. So Alberta is um, obviously Canada's oil province. It's based around heavy industry. And they have these huge, really big uh, trucks, tandem trucks. Um, so we started with the starting point on the left-hand side is, is really um, looking at um, heavy road transport and uh, what can we do about emissions in Western Canada. So we started with the understand the system bit and learned all sorts of things that you would never think about trucking. So the trucks are half empty. There's a driver shortage. Nobody wants to work in the industry. Profit uh, levels are like a couple of percent. Air pollution is terrible. And the trucking companies hate diesel. Now, this wouldn't be obvious, but the, the trucks are high maintenance. They know their industry is dirty. They would love an electric truck. Um, the problem is right now, battery electric trucks remain um, uh, not so good for the heaviest applications because the batteries have to be very heavy. This may change in the future, but right now hydrogen fuel cells make more sense. So we worked with the trucking companies and they got so enthusiastic that they wanted to actually do uh, a pilot. So we are just finishing um, building uh, two trucks that will run from Edmonton to Calgary on a commercial run for two years uh, to test out this. So my point really here is, I don't wanna say we're not a hydrogen organization, but simply this is the, the, the kind of proof of concept area that we've developed this. As you push through the past pathway process, you then redefine the question, push out the boundaries of the system. So hydrogen becomes an interesting economic development opportunity for Alberta both because it has very strong renewable, potential renewable resources and very cheap uh, methane, uh, which with CCS could give you a blue as well as a green hydrogen route. So it becomes an economic development uh, option. Uh, and that led us to spin out another consortia called the Alberta Industrial Heartland, 
hydrogen task force, which um, has mayors of municipalities, governments, academics, industry represented. Um, and in the next day or two, the Edmonton Hydrogen Hub will be set up, which is the first one uh, in Canada. Um, and again, my point here basically is that by working through the pathway process, we're able to spin out a whole series of, of kind of concrete uh, actions and change the reality on, on, on the ground. So when we started this process, we spoke to Suncor, which is the most progressive of the Canadian oil companies. And they said, this is really nice, but we're in the oil business. Don't call us, we'll call you. Um, and then literally two months ago, they called us basically because they are <laughs> finally beginning to get the idea of where the world is, uh, is going. Uh, and again, uh, changes in the attitudes of the governments and so on. So I'm not claiming we have responsibility for all this because a lot of things are happening in the broader political thing. But this pathway process has been able to change conditions on the ground, which are also changing the kinds of things that are politically uh, acceptable or, or you can think about. So the next thing I'll talk a little bit about is, um, and then they'll rush me off the stage because my time will be up, um, is this net zero report, which uh, we issued in um, uh, January of this year. Uh, and it essentially, it's a kind of, uh, it's written for people who are making decisions about net zero. And it basically tries to explain what is a, a transition approach uh, to uh, addressing uh, the problem of moving towards um, net zero and is very concrete and has lots of kind of simple color tables to say what's good and what, what's bad and so on. But to start with, this is the definition of pathways that we want to push, that they are the character, magnitude, and sequence of changes in technologies, infrastructure, business models, practices, policy, regulatory frameworks, etc., to transform a system to respond to societal needs, including net zero. So we want better systems, not just decarbonized systems. We want better, more convenient personal transport. We want more equitable uh, energy system and, uh, and so on. Um, and really, this is why, again, for people in the sustainability transition community, this may not seem, this may seem obvious, but explaining really that pathways are about multiple things. It's not just about net zero, but it's about, as I said, a better transportation system or a more equitable sum and so on. So there are three points I have here about why um, this is so important or why this is the case. So the first one is that we need to address where the system is going. In other words, where will it be in a decade or 20 years? There's no point in focusing decarbonization efforts on something that won't be here in a decade or is going to change in some other way. So the need to keep in mind um, uh, disruption, other societal trends, and so on. Um, people, let's just say individuals, voters, want a better world, not just a net zero world. And it's also is there's no way to address climate change and uh, squeeze out GHG emissions without impacting the existing system so in such a large way that you alter distributions and entitlements. So you can't possibly avoid the other questions and just think about uh, climate if that was your inclination. Um, so we emphasize two lens, transition and an energy systems lens. Um, this is just a diagram we use. This is the Canadian energy system. Um, I won't go through it, except that at a glance, you can see the problems with the existing world. 75% of our energy still comes from fossil fuels. 60% um, of Canada's fossil fuels are exported. Uh, it makes up that the extraction industry alone is a quarter of our emissions. Uh, the electricity system, however, is largely decarbonized. Only 9% um, uh, of the country's emissions come from uh, electricity production um, and 80% of the 
the industry is uh, decarbonized already. And on the right-hand side, you see some consumption sectors. Transport is the big one. Uh, half of that's personal and half of that's freight. So that's another quarter of emissions with buildings, industrial and agriculture having lesser percentages. So this is just a schematic image of a net zero energy system. Electricity grows enormously. Um, we need hydrogen or some other kind of net zero emission fuel, most likely a, a slight increase. I mean, some increase in biofuels. Um, the fossil fuel sector, to the extent that exists, has been squeezed right down and everything has to be uh, uh, net zero. So it's got to be with CCS and offsets to the extent that that's possible. And we have a little bit of uh, direct air capture and BECs and so on as well. And on the right, the carbonization. I'm not thinking any of this is new for people here, though some of you might whinge at seeing a residual fossil fuel sector on the left, the upper left. Um, but we find it quite useful to explain to people that you've got to think about how a system will be completely different and have that in mind as you decide, take your decisions today. So most of the report looks at sectors. So this is a summary of sector uh, for light duty vehicles, where we look at emissions, decarbonization options, what's the principal obstacle today, priorities for action, and, and so on. Um, and then we look uh, in detail at a whole series of Pathway elements, so these are not whole pathways, these are just particular technologies or practices. Um, and we evaluate them under these um, nine headings. And just to show you what it looks like, um, we have these assessment tables. So if we just take the top one, so battery electric vehicle, we look at its maturity, economic viability, acceptability. Can it can be part of a net zero pathway? Um, which we define in three ways, either it's in a net zero world, or it's a step to get to a net zero world, or it's an accelerate uh, to getting to net zero. And on the far right, um, we look at, should this be a priority for investment and government action and, uh, and so on. So simply put, battery electric vehicles end up green, potentially part of a net zero emission world. Bottom, um, of this table, ethanol blended with gasoline, which Canada does quite a lot of. We've gradually been increasing it to 8% or 7 or 8% of all gasoline in Canada has ethanol. So this is a dead end pathway because there is no way we can ethanolize the entire vehicle fleet. It's a waste of investment, not a priority, and government should stop funding these programs. So this is just an example of the kind of analysis in this report. Um, a list of priorities for the sectors uh, that we talk about, and not all sectors are yet covered. Um, we are um, extending the analysis to uh, additional sectors and to policy evaluation scorecard for different governments and things like that over the next uh, year or so. So, Actually, that's it. I just wanted to introduce you to some of that work. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you and happy to engage in the debate on basically anything you want to talk about to do with um, uh, sustainability transitions. Thank you. Ah. I can't hear. Oh, excuse me. Now you should be able to hear me. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks for this brilliant talk. Um, you get a lot of um, emojis um, in the audience. Um, we already have quite a lot of uh, questions um, on all aspects of your talk. So I'll try to structure this, structure this a bit, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll we'll be able to cover all of them. Um, so to to get started. Um, with questions on your take on on theories um, and and relevant authors, um, so Valentin Vogel um, is interested in whether you can share some of your favorite authors um, on some of the literatures, the five literatures in in, in political science that that you mentioned. Um, whether some yeah some authors can come to your mind. Yeah, well, um, this is going to sound really 
bad. <laughs> but um, I, I wrote an article kind of very early on, which was, I think it's called, it, it's on planning uh, theory. Um, and I actually took quite right-wing authors. And I find that often you can learn a lot. Uh, so Hayek, for instance, his critique of planning is really, really interesting. It's wrong, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it's not really interesting. Vildasky is another one in the United States. Uh, um, I detest his work, <laughs> but uh, often I find that you can learn um, as much from people who you think have got it completely wrong as people um, uh, who who have got it right. Um, on democratic th uh, th th kind of some of the normative theory, you've probably come across some of these writers already, like um, uh, John Dryzak, I would cite on deliberative democracy and things like this. Again, I don't agree with Dryzak. Um, because I think he's far too optimistic about uh, the potential for deliberative democracy and the difficulty in actually applying it in the real world politics where you actually have to make decisions in real time. Um, but it doesn't mean that I don't think it's, uh, you know, really interesting. Um, there's also interesting discussions on the green state, which I didn't mentioned on my list, but people like Robin Eckersley have contr uh, contributed uh, in in that area. Um, yeah, that's some of the first things that come to mind. Um, perfect. Um, then there's, there's one more targeted question um, on that, David Harvey, um, who uh, talks about the capture of state by corporations um, in order to establish their own agenda. And the question by David Flatt is, um, how do you think that researchers in sustainability transitions should address that issue? So um, capture by corporations. So one kind of general point I would make is that there's always been a tension in environmental people who specialize, academics who specialize in environmental politics uh, and policy between the extent to which you could you should focus on the area that you know and write in that area and engage with stakeholders around that and or the extent to which you should get you should reach further to the whole organization of society so in other words you can write about environmental politics and only discuss pollution control laws <laughs> or you can write about environmental politics and discuss the role of corporations in society, the tax rate, uh, and so on. And there is this uh, specialist, generalist, um, narrow reformist, impossibilist, revolutionist <laughs> tension, I think, in, in, in our writing. So one debate that I point, one thing happening right now that's really interesting in the United States, and I'm sorry to keep bringing up the US, but Canada's stuck to the US, <laughs> so it dominates our news and things like that. Um, but is Biden's proposal, some of you may have seen, to reform the tax code so that US corporations can't uh, shift all their profits to a uh, the Cayman Islands or something and pay no tax. So shockingly of something like the 100 top US corporations, between 20 and 40 paid no income tax in the past five years or past three years, let's say. They just don't, they, they make no profits in the United States. So that's just an example of something that is a reform that is related to economic development of the US, equity within the US. Um, has nothing to do with the environment or sustainability, but potentially gives um, huge tax revenue, which then could be spent on environment and sustainability thing. So I, going back to the question, corporations have too much power. It has to be uh, curtailed politically. So measures need to be in place that isolate the political system to the extent that it's possible from direct corporate uh, influence. Um, Anti-monopoly law is critical to democratic deliberation. You can't have 
two or three companies controlling 80 or 90 percent of the market share in every sector. If you have that, you will have great social economic inequality. You will have excess corporate influence in politics on all aspects of politics, including environmental uh, politics. So those big agendas seem to me unavoidable for people interested in sustainability. I don't know if I really answered quite the question, but. Um, yeah, I, I guess <laughs> if not, uh, people just write in the chat and we can, yeah. have, we can have follow up questions, of course. Yep. Um, there's another uh, question on, on, on kind of your take on, on the literature. Um, and basically uh, the question by, by Leo Fra Frank is, um, what in the beginning um, of your career, um, basically what were your essential criticisms um, in, in, in transis transitions research and how were they taken up by the research field? Um, so my, my, my initial uh, take really is, so I have an article which ended up, I think, being the most cited article of mine in the transition literature, which is something like, what about the politics or something? That's, that's in the title. And I don't know if anybody read the article, but the title looked good in a bibliography. So I think it, it, got, it got cited a lot. So really my criticism was that I felt that in the earlier frame, uh, some of the initial uh, transition work, politics wasn't explicitly enough present in the analysis. There was uh, historical analysis, there was discussion very much focused on socio-technical transitions, and the social was there, and the technical was there, but the explicitly political was not there so much. Um, and that comment, um, um, you can overplay it, because it, you know, and Frank uh, Hills has come back and said, no, we did, and he's right, they did. So it's a question of, 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 of emphasis. And I think that to a large extent that has been overcome as researchers have contributed pieces that more and more uh, put pol politics as a key component in the processes of, 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 of change. Of course, you still hear the original criticism, but academic literature is like that. You know, 40 years after something's been modified, someone will still say, ah, oh, it didn't do this. Um, but so I actually think progress has been made. A second thing which I criticized, um, which I think has not quite been changed so much, is that there's a tendency for academic communities to become uh, ghettoized. Um, so I'm also a member of something called the Earth Systems Governance Network, but there are many of these networks often disciplinary based. So they're communities in geography and they're communities in sociology. And this, um, and we tend to look more inward. And particularly as the theory becomes more elaborated, we can tend to use jargon. So we use the multi-level perspective, and then we throw around words like niche and regime, and we assume everybody knows them. And those are actually quite simple. But as you get more and more refined, you get more and more specialized, and the community is more and more talking to itself. Um, so I had thought early on that was a danger. Um, and I think it's something that still more progress could be made on. Um, it's not something I'm particularly critical of the transitions community because it's. I think it is reasonably open. Um, but I think more could be done still to draw in some other disciplines and engage with some other sets of communities. Brilliant. Um, we have more questions um, on the role of the state. Um, so uh, for instance, a question by Deborah Dutta. Um, so in a way, um, sustainability transitions uh, go against uh, conventional ideas of technocratic supremacy and economic development. Um, so the question is, um, in that light, how do states find a political will to support relevant interventions? Um, and she gives an example of India, where despite public support for organic farming, uh, most state subsidies are provided for chemical fertilizers and pesticides. 
And so, yeah, the question is really how, how can states uh, leverage? Uh, and, uh, okay. Oh, so, yes. <laughs> That's the $50 million question, of course. <laughs> so my claim about the state is, is two. One is that in practice, it plays a key role in transitions. Um, and it potentially can help in sustainability transitions. But of course, actually in my practice, it may help bring about unsustainability transitions. Um, so that really, so there you get into what, what makes states act in the ways that they do. And there are many elements that come into this. There are institutional questions. There are political culture questions. There are relationship of force questions between uh, proponents of reform and uh, proponents of um, uh, the status quo. So I'm not at all saying that states are the miracle answer. Um, they are, an, if we want to accelerate sustainable ability transitions, they have an absolutely critical role to play. And uh, when you accelerate things, I think there's that article by Sovacol that talks about this when they looked at some examples of accelerated energy transitions. In every case, the state steps on the gas, clears out things out of the way, and provides finance, big finance. And that's how things get done. But to get to that point is a really big uh, struggle, and it is ultimately a, a political struggle to build forces of reform um, and uh, and counter uh, those uh, those of the status quo. I don't know that I have a miracle answer. Um, all things in this are needed. You need lawyers suing governments for breaking their own laws. You need protesters chaining themselves to fences. You need green startups showing you can make lots of money doing it in a different way. You need international pressure on the worst, uh, you know, offender. So you need, it's, I guess you'd call it a shotgun approach. You need all levels of, of, of action. Um, and it may go, as you know, for a very long time that nothing much seems to change until the dam breaks and then things change very r rapidly. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I would say. I'm happy for a follow-up if <laughs> you want to come back on that. Yeah, sure. So please um, uh, send follow-up questions. Um, we we have another question that is is quite linked to the to the previous one, um, and that um, targets the challenge um, of states um, that are that have democratic polities, basically. Um, and so the question is, um, how how can we address um, the issue of changing governments um, in democratic societies, um, especially given the long time. Um, processes uh, involved with transitions and and also the, the complexity. Um, so basically, yeah, the question is how how can we challenge this question, this this potential problem of democratic societies and long time frames? Uh, in, in so in sorry, just to understand, is the the question about non democratic societies? How do you make change there, or is it about the democracies and how do you make change there? Not a, yeah, the question is how do you, so basically the question is how do you address the issue of changing governments in democratic societies? Oh, you mean that a government keeps changing and so they abandon the policy and bring yeah. in a new one? I guess that's, okay. what, that's what's meant with this question, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean that's kind of a, a question of policy instability um, and Governments in democracies are parties in democracies are looking for things to criticize and ways to differentiate themselves. So there is a tendency for the new government to come in and say, well, we're going to review that or they get rid of that. <clears throat> there is no magic solution to this. Um, I've actually written an, uh, uh, an article with some uh, colleagues. I think Danny Rosenblum is maybe the first uh, author on this about policy stability and climate change. Um, and 
so the the question is exactly that. And can, can, we've had that in Canada. So one government says, "Oh, we are in for a carbon tax," and the next one comes says, "No, carbon tax is a robbery of the people," and they abolish it. And the next one says, "Let's have a cap and trade system." <laughs> then the next one says, "No, the cap and trade system is no." So you get. Um, so there are some thinkers who argue that there are institutional measures to solve this problem. Like um, in the US, they've tried these kind of, um, what do they call them? Time bombs or, or Trojan horses or whatever. They, you put in a legislation something that if the legislation is abolished or repealed, something that everybody wants is gone. So, I mean, I'll give a silly example. You put in your climate policy thing, oh, an extra hundred, an extra thousand dollars to every family <laughs> every year. Then when you repeal the climate bill, people all lose their thousand dollars and so they scream about it. Um, I don't put much faith in these measures because they're kind of democratic tricks. You, 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 and and they don't work. The fundamental thing is you have to build a strong enough societal consensus around the fundaments of the the foundational elements of the policy that nobody wants to take it apart. That nobody can make sufficient political capital that they can win a majority in an election on dismantling that. And we have many policies like that, but in a democratic system, there is no ultimate guarantee. In other words, yes, kind of the people rule, kind of, or at least they have the right to kick out <laughs> who isn't going to rule them. Um, but what you can't do is prevent them doing stupid things uh, or prevent a coalition of parties coming in power that do stupid things. So I think you can build up that you can create, you know, you can create you to can some extent make institutional solidity, put things out of day-to-day -day control of politicians and make give them an independent status, that the things you can do like that that help the odds, but ultimately you need to build an underlying social consensus that nobody, you know, can get the strength to do that. Yeah. Um also, again, in, in this line of, of the role of the state and, and the question of, of um, democracy um, and the presence of the state, um, another question by Passion Muni um, and also seconded by Ines Zepa. Um, the question is, um, what, so what's the role of the state in areas and countries uh, with limited statehood? Um, um, for example, some post-colonial countries. Um, so how can we understand and analyze transitions in these uh, in these uh, settings um, and particularly the, the role of the state so when you're talking about weak um, limited states you mean uh, limited statehood you mean weak weak states states without financial resources or do you mean torn by civil war where the state isn't functioning um, the question doesn't uh, specify okay. um, so I'll assume that you mean states that have limited um, resources, institutional capacities, um, and this sort of thing. So I'm not sure there's anything magic to say there, just that if you have an efficient administration, a, a lack of corruption, a reasonably robust financial uh, underpinning, you're better, the state is better able to play a steering role. Um, if it isn't able to do a, steer, a steering role, that sort of steering role, then I actually think you have to deal with some of those questions in parallel. Uh, so pervasive com corruption is actually a big problem. Uh, and it needs to be a part of your kind of reform program. Uh, and so on. I, I don't know if that really addresses the question. Maybe the person could yeah. uh, chat back. <laughs> yeah, so please do so. Um, uh, there was also another question linked to this, um, um, which goes, um, how, how do we pursue transitions to a more sustainable reality in countries where groups in power protect the interests of a few more 
than collective interest. So that goes a bit um, in the same direction. Yeah. Um, so, so, so basically where you have short term um, yeah. and long term interests uh, that clash. So let me put it this way at a general level. Think about it this way. The state perf states perform certain vital societal functions. Uh, they maintain order. They uh, uh, maintain a legal system. They maintain territorial integrity. Uh, they um, mobilize resources for social projects. So in a sense, you can say states serve the common good, except that what that good is defined as is done by the dominant forces in the state. So it may be the good is workers should be paid cheap uh, and should keep their mouth shut because that way we'll build a great competitive international industry. Um, it may be, oh, we should pursue a more equitable society, et, et cetera. So the struggle is over the definition of that. And structurally, um, powerful corporations, uh, the groups that own the land in the country have enormous uh, structural power. So the answer is <laughs> you, you have to democratize society, you have to change the institutions, you have to I don't know if there's an, another separate way, um, but to say you're forced into general political struggle along with your um, your sustainability, you know, maybe your more focused environmental goals. It's a completely tactical question whether any individual organization, how far it goes down that route. So you might have an organization in a, an authoritarian country that was trying to protect um, endangered um, the species or, you know, uh, protect the rainforest or something like that. Such an organization could decide we are not going to say anything critical of the regime as a whole. We're just going to say how valuable the forests are and they're a national treasure. And that's fine. You could take that as a tactical decision for your organization. But actually, to protect the rainforest or you know whatever the, the the thing is, you would you will need someone saying we have to change the regime or the regime has to acknowledge such and such and such. So again, you get back to multiple strands of struggle with different kinds of groups doing what they're good at. Um, yeah. Perfect. Um... Uh, moving moving a bit away from states and uh, towards other actors, um, there's a question by Camilo, who's asking um, whether you can reflect on the role of international stakeholders um, on the global south. Um, he's giving the example of um, Canadian and U U.S. companies that are transitioning on their territories, but then oppose changes overseas. Well, what I can say about it is, is <laughs> yeah, it's not good, but it's completely natural. That's exactly what you would expect. The companies will move exactly so far as they are uh, compelled to do so. I mean, of course, you can have an individual company with a CEO who gets some kind of conversion and, and so on, and companies can gain competitive advantage by you know, showing that right across their supply chain, they're, they're being good citizens and so on. But it again, it's a question of relationship and forces and struggles. So you have to tear the veil back on that if you expect any progress. I mean, one of the, there's an interesting book um, some of you might want to look at called Behemoth, which is the history of the Bega factory. Uh, and it starts with the early cotton mills in England, and it goes through, you know, the huge, you know, tractor factories in, 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 in the Soviet Union, and it ends up with Amazon and uh, uh, Comcast and the people making iPhones. And they point out that critically, one of the main reasons for enthusiasm for the globalization was the ability to sever. Uh, the home office that looks after the brand from the manufacturing and the conditions of the workers. I mean, that's actually why you want to build your stuff in Vietnam, precisely because you can stand away from whatever they do to the workers in that, that country. Um, so only struggle on both ends of that supply chain are going to move that forward. Um, 
and I wouldn't expect, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what I would say. I One thing that just occurred to me, um, uh, in one of the earlier questions, the question used the expression political will. Um, so I almost, when I was going to, when I was thinking about this talk, I almost had a slide on the least helpful concepts from political <laughs> analysis and political science, as well as some of the more helpful ones. And political will for me is one of those um, because it's completely meaningless. I mean, what is political? I mean, what is political will? Essentially, it's a sum up of all the possible factors that are going back and forth um, for why a politician would decide to pursue a particular course or not pursue a, uh, a particular course. Um, yeah. So I noticed nobody has asked me anything on the second part of my talk about uh, the transition accelerator and stuff like that. And of course, I'm particularly interested in that part because that's actually how right now I'm spending much more time actually working with stakeholders on these issues than I am writing articles. Um, we, 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 yeah, we still have some. We still have time, and there are questions on the second okay. part. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so let's let's move to the um, second part. That was actually all the questions. Um, I hope I didn't um, I didn't miss any questions on the first part. Um, so there's a set of questions by Anna Magulis and Satoru Mitsuguchi, um, um, asking first um, who who was funding this this project. Um, that's maybe. Um, uh, an easy answer. And the second one is um, uh, Anna, who was wondering which frameworks and theories you recommend when co-developing innovation with stakeholders, um, as you did in this project. So the, the first one is easy. So far, um, most of the funding has come from what we call charitable foundations. <laughs> so there are a series of found Canadian foundations that support education and environmental causes and things like that. Uh, two of the biggest ones are the Ivy Foundation and the McConnell Foundation, Troche Energy Foundation. I guess maybe maybe 10 different foundations have, found, have funded us to a different amount. And then some funding from government, governments at different levels for specific projects. Um, I, what we're doing is makes the government very nervous. They talk to us and they support us. But when you ask them, oh, give us 5 million bucks and we can do so much more, they get very shy all of a sudden. So they're happy to give uh, $30,000 contracts for this piece of analysis or this piece of work, um, but they're shy about uh, anything else. I mean, I can tell you honestly on the hydrogen work, they were phoning us up and saying, please don't release your, your, uh, your analysis of hydrogen opportunities in Alberta. Uh, wait another month because by then we'll have done such and such. <laughs> um, and, you know, they, again, I'm not saying hydrogen is a solution to everything. It's just that it's the area where we'd, we'd done our first uh, trial. But they were kind of, we did more in, in nine months that they'd done in four years. And this makes the government officials very nervous. So they're very supportive, but they don't, they're afraid of losing control, I would say. Um, so that was the funding. So I hope that we will get more funding uh, in the future, obviously. Um, and then the other question was theories. And so it depends what you mean, actually, I won't say we're theory poor, but basically helping the stakeholders understand <clears throat> what is a system transition, where their place is in it, what, <clears throat> what would a vision look like for a transformed trucking system in 20 years' time, um, which are the pathways to do it. And then we use many analytical techniques, so uh, um, Techno-economic assessment, life cycle assessment, uh, social impact analysis, and so on, to look at to understand what a pathway looks like, what its macroeconomic modeling, all these different things that bring in the you know business model modeling that bring in different uh, dimensions of uh, 
the process. And I must say it's tremendously transaction heavy. It just takes endless uh, interactions to build up trust over time. Um, and then focusing on a practical objects as soon as possible. Like what pilot could we do? How could we get the government to change this regulation, which is stopping installing solar panels or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. But again, a follow-up question could make more clear if I've missed something. Yes, I'll, I'll let you know as soon as there is one. Um, there are other questions, though, um, also on, on your uh, accelerator project. Um, so uh, Richard Tonik um, is asking um, whether you can expand on the example of EVs in Canada um, and whether you can explain how the co-creation um, comes into the picture in, in the specific um, yeah. example or in the specific case. Okay, so the first, so a couple of things to understand. The first one is that we're not very good on EVs. So I think EV sales are around, uh, it depends by province, but overall they're two or 3% of uh, new vehicle sales. Um, it's not so far from the US, but way behind Europe to say nothing of Norway or, or something, like, something like that. The second thing, uh, is that until very recently, the major auto companies say they're in supporting EVs and actually are opposing EVs. Um, and the reason for that is simply they make so much mo more money off the existing uh, um, uh, drive chain. So they want EVs, but they would have liked them to be kind of between 2030 and 2040 and not so much between 2020 and 2030. Um, so the stakes in Canada really are, is this going to, and of course it's North, North American market really, is this going, this change going to take a decade to 15 years or is it going to take 15 to 30 years kind of thing? Um, and that has a huge impact obviously on GHG emissions, but also on who controls the emerging industry and all sorts of distributional issues as, as well. One thing, so let me say, because often when people here we're working on EVs, they say, oh, but you know, we don't need more cars. Uh, why aren't you focusing on active mobility and mass transit? And so let me just say, all of those things are critical. We need active mobility. We need better mass transit. We need more teleworking. We need to build the structure of cities differently. We need all these things do. But even if we do all those things to the maximum, in 15 years, there's still going to be millions of cars on the road in Canada, and they'd better be EVs. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, we, our transport emissions are more than a quarter of the emissions. But they're also the most easily changed now because that, you know, if you think of the phases of, of transition, there we're we're into the you know deployment acceleration phase. Uh, or not. And it's largely policy, but also investment decisions uh, that are made that will uh, change that. So one of the things that we're working on is the build out of the zero emission vehicle supply chain in Canada. So Canada still has um, a reasonably big auto industry, about 200,000 people work directly, but then there's maybe it's 500,000 or more with indirect jobs and a big auto parts industry. So this is completely integrated with the North American uh, auto market. Um, mostly they produce SUVs, gas guzzling SUVs, which are exported to the United States. So the, the, the countries are completely integrated. Those factories will be dead in a decade uh, if we do not enter the value chain in a big way. So the bizarre thing is Canada is extremely well positioned. We have all the strategic uh, minerals that you would need. We have electrochemical industry, auto assembly industry, pot industry, everything you, oh, and the IT, everything you would need. The one problem is we do not have a Canadian car company. <laughs> So we are dependent on multinationals. So one of the so electrification of the of society and the EV value chain are tied 
together because politicians are very hesitant to accelerate electrification if it's going to kill the, the existing automobile industry. So you need to build that value chain out to accelerate the um, vehicle, EV vehicle uptake, as well as build economic opportunity and so on. So we're working to, right now, we're almost, at, we've been working for a year to launch uh, an EV value chain uh, organization that will have, sorry, zero emission. So it has the people manufacturing electric trucks. So actually Canada has both truck and bus manufacturer uh, electri electrified. Um, uh, the mining companies, the metal smelting companies, right the way through to IT and stuff like that. And of course, EVs are critical not just for climate and stuff like that, but also because they feed into autonomous vehicles. And the whole next phase of robotization and internet connectivity and so on for industry up to the, the mid-century. So I should say a lot of the work the accelerator does is in the background. We don't headline ourselves like, you know, a press release, we've done this and we've done that. We work with companies, NGOs and stuff in the background to try and set things up, <clears throat> which then can accelerate uh, change. The, the, perhaps the last thing I should just say on this, why EVs are so strategic for Canada besides those obvious economic things is that they stop people using gasoline. <laughs> And that's really important because of our oil industry. Right now, people have an everyday relationship with gasoline. Based, well, not now because nobody's driving because they're not going to work. But normally, you know, once or twice a week, they fill up their car. They take gasoline. They know gasoline is the one consumer product where the price changes every day or weekly. You know, they post on the gasoline station how much culturally... Breaking that link is enormous. It's one thing to protest about pipelines and stop building, uh, uh, to stop them being built. It's completely different and much more effective to remove the demand for gasoline. Because once no longer, once gasoline sales are collapsing and diesel is a much harder thing for the heavy trucks, it will change the, the political cultural relationship with the oil industry and weaken inward investment. So part of the strategy for dealing with the 26% of emission, our emissions that come from oil and gas production is eliminate the market for gasoline in our country. Perfect. Um, we have one minute left um, according to the schedule. Um, and we have two questions left. Um, I'll maybe just read them out and then you, you decide. Um, um, how much you you want to to spend on these questions, and then we we have to wrap this up. Um, so uh, Pina Maridova asks um, whether the transition accelerator um, is also applicable to developing countries, um, or whether this is um, rather specific to the Canadian context and context of developed uh, countries. And kind of linked to this question, um, another question by Leo Frank is um, how you deal with the limitations of a national perspective um, when social technical systems go beyond national borders? So both excellent questions. So I actually think the, the accelerator model is extremely applicable internationally um, and maybe even more so in developing countries. Um, because the ultimate aim of the game is to change the relationships of force on the ground so that things that were politically not possible enter the realm of practical discussion. Uh, because you, so, and I should emphasize that we work with the innovative stakeholders. So it is not a thing like a government stakeholder roundtable where the oil companies get two votes and, you know, every, we would simply work with those who want to change the system and they can be companies social civil society organizations sympathetic people in government departments and so on so by moving this forward you build projects out on the ground pilots experiments can we set up consortia that campaign for specific 
things like a change in the building code or this kind of thing. So it's not, it's different than kind of an NGO demanding the government change this law or an academic writing a policy brief, oh, we need to reform this. What you do is you collect the societal stakeholders who go to the government. So it's the businesses that are saying you need to change this. Uh, it's businesses and NGOs working together agreeing that we should change this. So it's a way to move things forward if the political system is blocked and the politicians are too cautious. So I think it probably could be applied in developing countries to collect the actors together to move the, the, uh, the process forward. Um, internationalization. Okay, so obviously that's an enormous problem. Um, but the question is, national uh, organizations and institutions still do have uh, important political clout. Though, of course, it's different if you're Germany and if you're Sh Sri Lanka or, or something like that. So uh, states have different levels of, of, of power uh, and influence. We have not tried to build international coalitions because not because they aren't important, it's just a different niche. What we're emphasizing is the sectoral and regional change and the building of the thing from the ground up in, in the specific uh, regions. So yes, when you're talking about the auto supply chain, you've got to deal with General Motors, but we are not going to get General Motors to come. <laughs> They're not the first person we're inviting <clears throat> to the, the Canadian vehicle supply chain um we are i mean directly going to have to deal with the us in the auto case because the auto market is essentially north american canada mexico and the us and there's a delicate balance between networking canadian people in the canadian battery supply chain and building a north american battery alliance um both need to be done the problem for Canada, which is rather different than the EU, is our North American thing has one elephant, the United States, one developing country, Mexico, and one small internationalized country, which is Canada. So the US very often simply writes the rules and we have to eat them. So balancing, organizing internal to interface with a logic thing is a, is a political challenge. Ah, I'm losing my voice, and we've gone on too long. <laughs> yeah, thank you, James, for these uh, really detailed answers. Um, um, and yeah, we, we've come to the end of this uh, keynote. Um, again, thank you very much for, for coming, for joining. Um, it's been brilliant. Um, yeah, let's give, let's give James a round of virtual applause. <laughs> Maybe you can see these emojis. Yeah, very cute. Um, <laughs> and yeah let, let's hope that uh, soon we'll be able to have um uh, physical conferences again and and that and also work. i should maybe just say if anybody wants to follow up uh later um not the next three days because i'm getting in a research proposal but next week uh if anybody would like to follow up and discuss things or hear more about the accelerator i'm happy to correspond with people so thanks for having me, and uh, I'm so impressed with actually your conference. I haven't been able to attend se sessions, but I did look at the program and the topics and things like that, and it's such a, a high level of pr uh, professionalism from uh, emerging scholars. It's, it's really good. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks. Thanks again. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.